So a lot of people wonder how in the world you can have a symptom, especially one that's severe or long-lasting, when there's no structural abnormality, when there's no damage to the body, when there is no organ disease uh, that accounts for it. How can you have a symptom when there is none of those things? And it was not part of my medical school training. It's something that I had to learn um, over time in practice, but it turns out that what's happening in this situation is that there are changes in the brain and a lot of symptoms, chronic pain among them, have their genesis in the brain. And maybe the best example for this is someone who has had an amputation and they can still feel pain in the location of the amputated limb which clearly is no longer there. So where is that pain coming from? It's coming from the brain <clears throat> and nowhere else. So why is the brain doing this? What, what's, what's wrong with the brain that it's producing these symptoms? Uh, not, again, not only pain, but other sorts of symptoms throughout the body. And the reason for this is that there's been changes um, in the neuroanatomy, changes in the circuits uh, through which these uh, body signals are processed, which begs the question, well, why are those changes there? <clears throat> and in many cases, at least, um, it seems to have come from chronic stress. Um, that stress that has gone on in your life long enough, especially trauma or adversity, um, we see this particularly in uh, people who were suffering adversity as children, that it seems to have the capability of changing the circuits in the brain, which then process these body signals inappropriately and produce the symptoms uh, that we see. Again, with no damage to the body, with no organ disease. And the good news is that these changes can be reversed uh, through treatment. So it's not a permanent condition. When you think about changes in the brain, you may think, oh, I'm stuck with this forever. Not the case at all. We can, we can turn this around. This is the process, this is the mechanism, uh, but this is also the hope. Uh, because um, now that we've identified this through functional magnetic resonance imaging studies um, and we've identified treatment measures uh, that are effective for this, um, we can make people better. Uh, we don't have to uh, just throw up our hands and say, um, you have to live with it. <clears throat> we've got much better um, resources than that. People who want to learn more about this, the best place to go on the internet is the PPD Association website, which is ppdassociation.org. And we've got uh, entire lists of evidence-based resources there that patients can use, that physicians can use, mental health professionals can use. We even have an annotated and indexed bibliography of all the available research we could find, that over a hundred, well over a hundred references uh, on that list that support this approach. The problem with the references in the past has been that they've been published in so many different journals that any individual specialist looking at their own uh, literature has not seen very much of this. You have to really uh, scour across uh, an incredibly broad range of journals to find the collective quality and quantity of evidence that supports this approach. So I encourage everybody to go to the website and check out what's there because it's solidly grounded in research.